Hey there, welcome to episode 306 of The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast where we cover all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and anxiety recovery. Now today we do not have any music, we don't have any fancy intro or outro, but we do have a conversation about rational emotive behavior therapy, REBT. REBT, I kid you not, is the OG of modern cognitive behavioral therapies. It was created and introduced to the world by Dr. Albert Ellis back in the 1950s and 1960s. He really led the way in modern cognitive behavioral therapies, and REBT has been in widespread use ever since. It's an empirically supported therapy. There's a lot of data and research behind it. And today, we have a very special guest to join us to talk about REBT. Her name is Dr. Debbie Jaffe Ellis, otherwise known as Dr. Debbie. And while she does have the same last name and was, in fact, married to Dr. Ellis, she was his collaborator at the tail end of his career. But her work stands on its own. She is more than just the wife of the late Dr. Ellis, but she was his partner, his collaborator, and she is a bit of a legend in therapy and counseling herself. So Dr. Debbie was kind enough to take some time to talk to us today about REBT. We're going to talk about its origin stories, its nuances, its unique features, how it might be applied in the context of treating anxiety disorders. I had a great time talking to her. She is a lovely individual, very friendly, very open, very kind, very willing to share and educate. It was really good. Before we get to the interview, just a quick reminder that The Anxious Truth is more than just this video or this podcast episode. There are a ton more resources that you can find on my website at theanxioustruth.com. Go check it out if you're so inclined. Let's get Dr. Debbie on. I hope you guys enjoy this. I'll come back at the end to wrap it up. Dr. Debbie, Dr. Debbie Jaffe Ellis, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to hang out today for a little while. It is my pleasure on this cloudy Manhattan day to hang out with, with you, Drew, and, and enjoy uh, talking about whatever we're going to talk about. We are going to wing it. Now, you guys know me enough to know that I often wing it. And Dr. Debbie was clearly my people. She's like, yeah, let's totally wing it. And I'm like, we can, this is what we're going to do. So before we get started, you know, we were talking before I hit the record button about the audience for this podcast is predominantly people dealing with anxiety disorders. So give us the Reader's Digest version or not. Talk as long as you want. I don't care if you take up the whole episode. I'm just going to listen. Within the framework of REBT, Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy, how would you approach things like panic disorder, agoraphobia, OCD, GAD, you know, that, you know, the usual suspects, what does REBT have to tell us about those particular struggles and how do you approach them? Yeah. REBT can be very helpful. Now, depending on the degree of the impact of whichever of those emotions that you mentioned, it may take a longer or shorter time to notice significant change. Mm. But with ongoing effort, uh, applying what I'm about to describe, it's a biological scientific fact that change is probable if a person persists. So what am I talking about? So, um, Drew, I'm not familiar with uh, whether your listeners are familiar with the principles of REBT. Well, I, my listeners generally understand what CBT is, but ah. I've never really given the difference and the fact that REBT predates CBT. So, yeah, let's do a little background on what it really is. That would be great. Okay, my pleasure. So, REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, uh, created my, by my late, brilliant, amazing husband, Dr. Albert Ellis, heralded in the cognitive revolution in psychotherapy. He was trained to be a psychoanalyst, a la Freud, because when he was at college, there really wasn't any choice. There was Freud, there was early behaviorism. Anyway, he was an excellent psychoanalyst, but he felt impatient with, him, with it because he noticed that many of the people he worked with felt better after a session and there could be insights. They weren't getting better. They weren't proactively making effort to change whatever thinking and behavior was contributing to disabling emotions mm -hmm. or disturbances. And so bit by bit, and we don't have time for me to go into the whole history, but he created REBT. Um, now, he was a mentor 
and a help and an inspiration to Dr. Aaron Beck, who's considered the father of CBT. CBT came out 15 years after REBT. So I'm really glad for anyone who's interested in accurate historical chronology that REBT was the pioneering cognitive approach. So there's the background, a few little bits about it before I answer your first question about anxiety and panic and so forth. So one of the main principles of REBT, and I love it because it's so empowering. And if a person certainly is not cognitively impaired, but if they are not and have the willingness to make change in order to create less misery and experience more joy in life, in life that will contain in all probability challenges and loss and, and some pain, healthy pain of loss and so forth. But one of the tragedies, I believe, of, of so many humans is they're not aware and here's the point I'm leading to the first basic element of REBT, that it's not circumstances that create our emotions, but the way we perceive the circumstances, how we think about them, our beliefs about them. And if we think in irrational ways about happenings that we don't want, some that may be brutal and tragic or, or not getting what we do want, uh, when we think in irrational ways, we create what REBT calls unhealthy negative emotions. Negative not because they're bad, but they're not so pleasant. And they include anxiety, extreme fear, panic, hopelessness, despondency, depression, rage, guilt, and shame. Now, their healthy counterparts, which we create when we think in healthy ways, are concern instead of panic, fear, and anxiety. It's healthy to have that little adrenaline-boosting motivation to move our tushes and, and get things done and so forth or to attend to certain things. So concern is healthy. Anxiety, panic, fear, debilitating. Uh, when we think in rational ways instead of despondency and depression, healthy grief, sadness, disappointment. Instead of rage, that moral anger. We're still in control. We don't react. We choose as best as we humanly can to respond when we receive or observe immoral, unethical behaviour or situations. And finally, instead of guilt and shame, which often are present when a person is, is, is not experiencing meaning in life and, and is hopeless and often present in people who attempt suicide, yeah? mm. we experience and create regret, which is another, uh, like healthy anger, emotion connected to our inner moral compass. So very quickly, getting to answer your question about anxiety, panic and fear, what are the irrational ways of thinking that would create anxiety and other unhealthy negative emotions? We have demands, we have shoulds, we have must, very rigid thinking. And uh, a few of the common ones are I must do well, and be liked, loved, approved of by everyone. Now, when someone holds that, little wonder that they create anxiety if someone looks at them cross-eyed or with a disapproving face, or if they're rejected or abandoned, because they have this underlying irrational belief that they must be approved of, or, or it's awful, or it proves they're worthless or worse. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. Now, in my audience, just to interject a little bit, Please. we see that the must is always, I must only be calm or I must not feel these feelings to be okay. That's the, that's the predominant must among the people who are listening to you right now, I would say. Huh. Yeah. I, I, it, it, it sounds like the uh, a belief behind those beliefs, uh, I must not be me. I must not be human. Uh, I must not. I must not be fallible. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, if if I'm not acting as I should, I must not be compassionate and gentle of myself um, in ways I probably easily am with others. Okay. Yeah, aren't we cruel to ourselves when yeah. we're not thinking things through? Yeah, it's it's amazing. I think the amount of self criticism that comes out. I'm failing because I'm anxious. I'm failing because I can't control this very human experience that was never meant to be controlled. So. Yeah. yeah, I hear you. Does that speak a little bit to the rationality, how REBT sort of defines rational? Who decides what's rational or not? People, I'm sure people are wondering, well, who decided that? Did Albert Ellis decide what was rational? No, but he really very succinctly described some of the main elements, which include coming to what you were saying, Drew, unconditional self-acceptance that every human has worth simply because we exist. We may do some bad things, some shitty things, doesn't make us a bad person um, akin to excrement. Uh, we may do some saintly things, it doesn't make us a good person, it makes us a person who's done some good things. So each human, this is inherent in REBT and in other philosophies, by the way, but I'm here as the REBT queen or whatever you want to call me, <laughs> queen for the day. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that um, I mean, I, I, I ask listeners, ask yourselves, how comfortable do I allow myself to be in my own skin? How much effort, if any, am I making to embrace my fallibility? And, and even when I'm creating an unhealthy emotion, is that a reason that I have less worth or to put myself down? My response to that and yours, I'm sure, Drew, is no. Yeah, that's true. That, so you, you're, So one of the elements of irrational might be are you beating yourself up for just existing as any human might be reasonably expected to? That that seems irrational. So I would agree with that, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then like a few other elements of irrational thinking, just to give um, listeners and viewers an opportunity to reflect on whether they think in any of these ways. Uh, I mentioned I must always do perfectly well, love the you and you can be an individual or a group or a religion or a political party. Gee, any political stuff going on right now? No, anyway, no, I, no, no, no. Um, don't know why I thought of that. <laughs> so you must act the way I think you should. You must believe the way I think you should believe. You must believe what I believe. You must treat me the way I think you should. You know, that belief is at the heart on a milder scale, though it's not necessarily mild relationship breakups, but on a global scale, that belief, you should be the way I think you should, is at the root of terrorism and war and hatred. Yeah. Yeah. I and, need, you should be the way I need you to be or I want you to be. I, I insist that you be or, or else it proves that you're not worthy. Mm. Or worse. Do you ever find that that's a difficult, and it's interesting because yeah. there, there's a, a bent in REBT that I, I really identify with, and because it's a an acknowledgement of the reality of the way the world and people are, which is really important, I think, as in part of REBT, at least the way I see it. And so there's almost an irrationality. The next, the third thing that I might think would be irrational in that framework would be, I am refusing to acknowledge the reality of the world as it just is. People sometimes aren't like us, or I do make mistakes, or I do have bad feelings. Yeah. This is the way life is sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say the, the attitude that's encouraged through REBT or common sense wisdom is the benefit of adopting an attitude of realistic optimism. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. yeah. So optimism because, damn it, where there's life, there is hope. Unless one literally is in pain almost 24-7, you know, and, and quality of life is is not good and, and there's really no biological indication that things will get better. But for that and if someone is, is cognitively impaired, 
and, and unable to be, you know, if there's a psychosis or, or not able to understand the principles that we're talking about. And they're not complicated, but so, but for those instances, there are enough examples that where there's life, there is hope mm. that things can get better. Oh, the other group of people that doesn't apply to, and I'm not meaning to sound facetious here, is, is when people do die. You know, COVID, I mean, for them, the, the ones that survived, there was hope of better days that the restrictions might end, which which they mainly did not. Of course, that didn't apply to those who succumbed. But people who are listening to us are alive. We're talking, I hope, we're talking to them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good, but I'm not that good. I'm not reaching the deceased. I'm, I've got a big audience, but they're all alive. That's true. Well, as far as you know. As far as I know, at least. I don't know. If there's any zombies listening, shoot uh, me an email. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, you know, unusual life forms. But apart from that, um, so reality-based, definitely. And, in fact, one of the things that REBT encourages us to do if we are determined to suffer less and enjoy life more is to identify those self-defeating beliefs and dispute the guts out of them. And one of the ways we dispute it is through asking questions. And one of the questions is, where is the evidence? Again, reality-based. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm telling myself I, I have no worth, I don't deserve to exist. Where's the evidence? Oh, I failed at this. How does that, how does it follow that if you fail at something, you have no worth? You know, this kind of questioning and questioning, how is it logical? Where is it getting me or you or us to think in these ways? And we question the irrational beliefs. And as a result of that, new realistic truths emerge. Well, I may not be perfect, but I have a right to exist. Um, you know, it, it, it depends on, on what the issue is, who the person is. Uh, I have worth simply because I am. I like the approval of others, but I don't need it. Mm. Your opinion of me is none of my business. That's Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I always love that one. You know, one of those in, my, in this audience that you're addressing today might be, I can't handle extreme anxiety. But, but you always do. I just don't like it, but you do handle it. So where's the, one of the things you said earlier, which is really great, like there's a high likelihood of change. I mean, I might argue that change is going to happen no matter what you do, because we change. The world is not, people are not static. The world is not, the universe is not static. So where's the, where's the agent of change? So if you as the helper, I'm, I'm your client and you're, you're the therapist and I- I well, hope for you. No hope for me. Clearly, no. everybody knows this, but I, and I tell you, someone you know, else. I, I can't. No, it's fine. I, I can't handle this. Your challenge to me might be, well, where's the where's the evidence for that? Now, yeah. yeah. Now, does a change come just because you you told me that my thought was irrational? No, your change has very little to do what I'm going to tell you, and everything to do with the effort that you're going to make. And so the change will come through repetition, repetition, repetition. There's this field called neuroplasticity that has proven that with repetition, be it behaviours, physical behaviours or thoughts, new neural pathways are formed in the brain. And not just when we're kids, you know, when we're adults, and there's, unless there's some neuropathy or, um, sorry, neurobiological reason, it's not too late. And so through repetition, neuroplasticity has found that it takes at least 30 days. For some people, it might be more. For some people, it may not be more. For new neural pathways, new habitual ways of thinking to, to be formed in the brain. Mm. So the key is identify the toxic thoughts, dispute the guts out of them, because if we don't believe them, they're less likely to come up. Now, habitually, they may still for a while, mm. in which case we keep disputing. But as time goes on, what's not credible, because we disputed it, we saw there was no truth in it. 
is less likely to come up. And then the more we repeat the healthy new rational recognitions, mm -hmm. you know, put it on your phone, post it all over the place, um, remind yourself, put it, record it and listen to it a few times each year. I have worth because I exist. I honour my fallibility. I embrace being human, mm. whatever it is. Where is it written that? Da, da, da. And repetition, repetition, therein lies change. No, not what I say to anyone. Hopefully that triggers an awareness, but then repetition, repetition, and notice the change over time. Yeah, that makes sense. It sounds like the challenge there to the irrationality can, not, there's cognitive restructuring there, but it also might inform a different action. So if I'm stuck in maladaptive avoidant behavioral patterns that are based in my irrational thoughts, hey, Dr. Debbie might give me a reason to at least consider that maybe that belief isn't correct and I can act in different ways. Would you use that as part of the framework? Certainly, you know, whatever helps. Whatever mm -hmm. helps. Some people, it's, it's the actions. For others, it's the thinking alone. For many, yeah. it's both and. Um, and and to go back to what you brought up a few minutes ago, Drew, um, when someone said, oh, I forget your exact words, but along the lines of I always make myself anxious or, or I, I can't stop being anxious, I forget, what, but along those lines, I will immediately say, insert, till now. Ooh, yeah, really good, because right? Because the past does not need to dictate what the future will be unless we keep on doing what we've tended to do. Mm. They're very practical sounding. I mean, it, it, everybody listening, if they've hung around for a while, this is all sounding very familiar, right? All this stuff seems to align so nicely. And the idea that we have agency here. Yeah, that I love the practical application here. Like, look, let me show you that you actually do have some power here. You are able to enact a change. Only we can create our own change. No one can do it for us. Others can encourage, guide, educate. I think that their roles that you and I love to, to um, enact, to be, to it. But um, unless someone takes action and works on themselves steadily and consistently, change won't happen. Now, sometimes a person will work on themselves and there's relapse. Hello, human, not unusual. So as the song goes, I see the instruments on your wall, um, pick myself up, write <laughs> myself down and start all over again. Why do I feel like if, if I'm your patient or client, there's going to be singing at some point. I don't know why. I was in a, in a webinar that Dr. Debbie did a couple of weeks ago where you, you had everybody in the, on the Zoom trying to sing together. That was great. So, yeah. yeah. Why do you think that way? Because you have evidence. Um, and maybe you also think I like to torture other people. <laughs> yeah, that must be what it is. Uh, um, oh. Must? Must? You said must. That's another thing I do. I jump on people, not necessarily literally, but with humor, when I say people, clients or students, um, mm -hmm. to help them be more aware of what can be thoughtless, habitual lingo, um, the must word, you know, the should. Yeah. And one of the, the gifts of REBT, and again, there are other philosophies and approaches who do this too, but I'm talking about REBT, is the encouragement to be more mindful, to think about our thinking and, and to choose our words. Words do have power, you know, yeah. and, and very impactful, if not consciously, subconsciously. Uh, and so um, I, I do it with humour, but <clears throat> if you're at one of my classes, like just yesterday at Columbia, uh, someone, uh, one of my students was talking and said must, and I like, must, and it, it, it creates laughter, but there's a point to that. Yeah, yeah I kind of get that. There's rigidity in must. I guess two key words would be must and should, right? I should or I must yeah. or I have to, I can't. Yeah, yeah. And REBT asserts that one of the most powerful ways, and the good news is it's not even difficult, 
but it requires consistent effort, which is identify the shoulds and musts. Identify them. Then dispute them, question them. Then replace them and repeat, repeat, repeat. Not hard, but it, it, need, it needs to, it's required to be done if one sincerely is motivated to change. Now, I say that because some people love blaming others, love blaming life, um, are kind of addicted to being the victim and the attention that can bring. So if they're not motivated to change, they might say, well, I, I hate being anxious. But, but if the payoff in their minds is maintaining unhealthy ways of being and feeling in order to get what they think are rewards, they probably won't change, may yeah. get up to change. Oh, that's that principle of autonomy. You get to pick the path you want and we get yeah. to respect it, I guess. But yeah, yeah, that's really great. I love how you bring up the the, the ties to, I, I think REBT is one of the most philosophical. Yes. Yeah. So you could draw a straight line back to the Stoics and Taoism and Buddhism. We suffer because we resist. We go with the way of the Tao. We control what we can and leave the rest behind. You know, there's so much philosophy in there that I love so much. It's so true. Um Al, Albert Ellis, Dr. Albert Ellis. Al, that's okay. We can call him Al. Well, yeah. You, okay. oh, you were married to the guy. <laughs> I, exactly. I was married to the guy. I slept with the guy. I didn't call him Dr. Ellis. So I will call him Al. We do not judge what people do in the privacy of their own home or anything. Just saying. Oh, feel free to judge. <laughs> the judge is fantastic. Anyway, he um, said. Yeah, no, so he was literally a genius, a speed reader, and as a child, he would borrow as many books as, as his local library would allow him to, to borrow and read them, return them read overnight, and he loved philosophy. And in his creation of REBT, certainly, and, and you mentioned the Stoic philosophies and, some, and the Eastern philosophies, definitely, were uh, influences and aspects, as he would acknowledge, are uh, embedded in the REBT philosophy. And um, it's, um, it's interesting. I have one of his books that was published in the 1800s. Well, not one of his, but he didn't write it. No, he didn't write it. He owned it. And, and it's... Um, wow. By Epictetus, the Enchiridon. I probably yeah, pronounce, that's yeah. the Matthew Manual of Life. I, it's right there. I, I'm not the 1800s version, the new version. It's on my yeah, show. so, so my, the 1800 version is there and, you know, gold around the yeah. board and beautiful. And the way Al would read books was um, he would underline bits that were significant. He would put crosses next to parts he didn't agree with and checks next to parts that he did and then he would underline in USA unconditional self-acceptance when what he was reading in the interrogant or, or the Tao or, or Buddhist works uh, by La and uh, works by Lao Tzu and um, yeah so you're right that uh, elements of those philosophies now there are differences as well like with Eastern philosophies there's a lot in common between Tibetan Buddhism and REBT. And actually, um, the Dalai Lama in one of his books called The Art of Happiness acknowledges Drs. Ellis and Beck's psycho... That's the book. That's the book, right? <laughs> there you go. All right, so we both get to... We both look, are we, we both are we surrounded by the same library? <laughs> we we uh, seem to be. Yeah. Yeah. I have way too many books about Vikings. So I will admit that. Neither have I. Right. But, yeah, I, I think they probably did quite a bit of shooting in their canoes. Probably. It worked for them, evidently. So the Dalai Lama was a fan, it sounds like, or he at least acknowledged the work. Yes and yes. Uh, on my husband's 80th, sorry, 90, I I was I didn't know him when he was 80, but he was a lot older than me, just want to say. Um, in case anyone's wondering, I'm not 110 and this isn't great plastic surgery. I, I haven't had any plastic surgery, but anyway. Um, no, the Dalai Lama sent Al a, a, 
a white silk scarf that he had blessed. And um, and Al was actually, Al and I ha had arranged to go and visit him um, one weekend. His late brother had a, a temple, I think in, I want to say Iowa or Idaho, somewhere starting with an I. And we had planned to go. The Dalai Lama was there. And the night before the journey, my husband was seriously ill, like he nearly lost his life, so we couldn't make it. But we were we were planning to go. They had much in common. Um, both of them, and, and they said this in different times, um, loved to explore things when they were kids, would pull clocks and, and toys apart in order to figure out how they worked and put them together again. Both of them uh, chose to work on a tendency to be angry and impatient. Even the masters make effort if they're human when they're human. Yeah, right. And um, both of them, like Tibetan Buddhism and, and REBT, embrace this attitude of unconditional other acceptance where one can detest brutal behaviour but not detest the person doing it mm. or hate them or dislike them intensely. And so in the case of the Dalai Lama, he said he, whilst he's against uh, the, the policies of the Chinese government, he doesn't hate Chinese people. And my husband, sadly, at the end of his life, in the final years, his institute kind of fired him and kicked him out for no good reasons. And it, there's a lot of publicity at the time because my husband was an icon, deservedly, and New York Times and New York, and there are articles and so forth. And, and uh, I think it was the New York Times or the New Yorker magazine, one of the articles quoted my husband as saying, I hate what they're doing. They, the certain directors of the Institute that had mm -hmm. kicked him out and wanted to change the mission statement, hate what they're doing, Al said, but I don't hate them. And that was true. I mean, it wasn't just the master wanting to sound authentic. He was authentic. He didn't hate them. He even had compassion on, on their limited ways of thinking that, and their ambition, their selfish in some ways ambition, that drove them to do some of the actions that they did. So, um, yeah, Al and the Dalai Lama had many things in common. But I was saying to say some of the things that are different really briefly, the language. Mm -hmm. The absolutism in some Tibetan Buddhist encouragements, such strive for perfection, reach the state of nirvana. So Al would say... He, he was sceptical that that was possible, perfection, striving for excellence, you know, but but it could be self-defeating and even harmful for a person to think they should attain a particular state that may realistically not be possible. Strive for excellence, yes. Strive to be perfect, uh, what's the lot? Mm, I think and, that, and anxiety, you know, from I, I must be perfect, and if I'm not, hello, anxiety. Yeah, especially for the folks struggling with GAD, that's a, a big yeah. component. Oftentimes, it's interesting because, and, and I'm a fan. I'm not, I'm not picking anybody here, but if we look at things like mindfulness-based stress reduction and John Kabat-Zinn, who often gets, and he deserves all the credit he he gets for sure. Well, he westernized, he made it Western accessible. Some of those Eastern philosophies, but I might argue that. He wasn't the first one to do that, you know, because I, I, that language, the omission of the absolute achievement, which, yeah, in Western culture would get gripped onto as evidence of my, that's how I know I'm doing better when I achieve. You got to drop that in our culture, I think. So that was brilliant to leave that out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now I'm just like fanboying here. That's so... <laughs> Bring it on, bring yeah, it on. Somehow whether we veered into just like a chat that I'm enjoying. I don't know if you guys are enjoying it, but um, I, I think one of the cool things is when you look at the example that that the Dalai Lama sets, that that your husband set, that these people set, what it says again and again and again is I have a choice. I have agency, even in difficult situations because life is going to hand them to me. I have some agency in what I do with that. 
I don't like what they're doing to me, but I don't hate them. Boy, there's such power in that. And that's applicable to people with anxiety disorders. Maybe not directly, but it's that that idea is applicable. Yeah, have- yeah. And Drew, as you kind of touched on earlier, and then we we got on a, a another stream or a, a related stream, but it's it. A lot of people might think that it's not easy. How do I unconditionally accept someone who's done rotten things to me? Mm. who's really acted in brutal ways. And the people who are willing to accept the fact that hanging on to their, their toxic anger about the wrongdoer or their resentment Bitterness, and and what I'm about to say is a phrase that my husband created, but it's now part of everyday lingo. So hanging on to that is like eating poison and waiting for the other person to die. It's not going to hurt them, but it it can literally shorten one's life. So how does one achieve that? You know, look at murderers, rapists and so forth, especially if they've impacted one personally and unconditionally accept them. Well, first of all, it's important to realise that doesn't unconditionally accepting another person doesn't mean you unconditionally accept their rotten behaviour. And REBT would certainly encourage seeking justice when possible, but from a, a state of stability rather than rage. And and uh, so when someone earnestly recognises that they've been holding on to this toxic emotion and it's hurting them and they don't want to but they don't know how to drop it, I invite them to consider the, pos- the, the following, that, again, when, what it, what, it requires one wanting to change. Mm-hmm. So the evildoer, and, and hear what I say, I didn't say the evil person, but it's a person who did some evil things in that instance or instances. That that person was once a baby too, once a helpless little piece of biological life as well, just as any one of us was. Mm. And I ask a person to consider if any one of us had their biology, their neurobiological chemical makeup, their genetic predispositions, if any one of us was brought up the way that they were brought up and and got some toxic, negative, hateful messages, were were indoctrinated subtly or or overtly to believe they're worthless and useless and, and, and had some kind of bad influence in puberty, teenage years, adult years, if any one of us was thinking what they were thinking when they did the evil actions, isn't it possible that we would do a similar or the same thing? And I think if one is ruthlessly honest, one would say, yeah, it's, it is likely. And, and that can allow us to be grateful for the fact that we may not have done anything as brutal as that. Mm. It also can remind us that if we have done a bad thing, to distinguish between that bad thing and the fact that where there's life, there's hope, we can work on not repeating doing that bad thing. Mm. So anyway. much of it, yeah, no, that I, I love all this. So much of that would, would almost imply then if I'm going to adopt unconditional other acceptance or unconditional self-acceptance. I'm going to give, forgive myself for the thing that causes me so much guilt because we do see, even though this is not necessarily anxiety disorder territory, you know, I don't have to tell you, you've been at this longer than I have. That stuff often enters the chat anyway. There's not just panic attacks. There's other stuff. That could be so helpful, but it implies you may have to just learn how to be with uncomfortable feelings sometimes. I am so angry at this person for what they did for me or to me, but If I'm going to move past that, I'm going to have to learn how to be with that anger and let it work itself out in a healthy way instead of hanging on to it as rage. And that's that's tough work. Yeah, but, oh, it's so worthwhile. 
So anger about anger, that's called like a secondary emotion or anxiety about anxiety. Oh, I'll never get over my anxiety. I've, I've gone to therapy for three weeks and I'm still anxious. <laughs> and, and so the, the way to handle that secondary anxiety or unhealthy emotion is to deal with it first before going back to the primary by normalising it. It's not unusual. It's common. It can take time. And to encourage, as you said, that unconditional self-acceptance. I'm fallible. I have flaws. I've been doing this a long time, believing this a long time. It will take time. I can make effort bit by bit. If I relapse, I can pick up. And just self-nurturing, self-encouragement. And that often can can lessen or, or remove the anxiety about the anxiety and then we can get to the root uh, thoughts behind the anxiety. Now, not to ignore some people have an endogenous predisposition and sometimes medication helps, but sometimes medication is not necessary and just ongoing effort. And by the way, medication alone is not empowering. It can bring a, a kind of stability, but if a person benefits from certain medication plus does the REBT or similar empowering, life-enhancing work, that's that, that leads to living comfortably in one's own skin. That is authentic empowerment. Um, so, but, you know, anxiety, it, it, and I'm preaching to the choir, I said, you know, so debilitating. And, and really, I invite any of your listeners who haven't done this yet and to those who have done it to do it again, just think about what's your attitude to yourself and how you should be in life. And my guess is that in all probability, you're being tougher on yourself than you are to your pet dog or cat if you have pets or people. Um, why? How tragic. No one is more responsible for us than ourselves, except when we're little helpful, helpless babies. And so that we could innocently, naively, unthinkingly be so cruel to ourselves. Whoa. So stop it. <laughs> <laughs> stop it. Have you ever seen the old Bob Newhart stop it sketch? I will. Okay, when we get done, I'm going to send that to you, and you will laugh. I predict that I will laugh. <laughs> yeah, all right, very good. Anyway, this is such a great discussion, but we're kind of running out of time. We don't want to go too long, and I don't want to take up the rest of your day, or I would just talk to you till the sun goes down, which it kind of already is over here. But, you know, uh, I've got an hour more sunlight. You can talk some more, Drew. Yeah. Or we can meet again. Yeah, maybe we'll have a part two of this. There's so yeah. much to cover. That's so great. Yeah. You're so generous with your time. I appreciate that. My so pleasure. My pleasure. So I will come back and wrap that up. Dr. Debbie, thank you so much. You've been so lovely and I cannot wait to have you back on. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. And uh, I truly hope that uh, some of the things that you and I talked about can, can touch a person's mind and heart and if nothing else, they'd be easier on themselves every day. Um, I look forward to our next chat. And thank yes, you so great. much. You're very welcome. Thanks for coming. And we are back. Well, that was a thrill for me because having Dr. Jaffe Ellis, Dr. Debbie on the podcast was a real get for me. Like I really admire her work and I feel like it's such a privilege and an honor for me to get to talk to people of that stature in the field. I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot today about REBT that I didn't know before Dr. Debbie came on, and hopefully you guys picked up a bunch of goodies as well. If you would like to know more about Dr. Debbie and REBT and the work that she does, I will put a link to her website in the podcast notes. If you're listening on as a podcast in your app on YouTube, I'll put them in the video description, or you can go to get the full show notes for this episode to my website at theanxioustruth.com slash 306. That will get you the notes for this episode and links to wherever Dr. Debbie happens to be on the internet. So that is it. Hopefully this was as useful to you as it was fun for me. 
We will be back again in two weeks with another episode of The Anxious Truth. I don't know what it's going to be about, but it will be here. And if you kind of really dig what you got here today and you're watching on YouTube, maybe subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment. I promise I will get back into the comment section as soon as I can when time allows. And of course, if you're listening as a podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform lets you write a review or leave a rating, maybe leave a five-star rating if you really like the podcast. And if you really dig it and you're getting something out of it, maybe take a minute or two and write a review and tell people why you like it. Because then more people find the podcast or the YouTube channel, and then more people get help and they get the information like Dr. Debbie was kind enough to share with us today. And remember, as I sign off, I will remind you, as I try to every week, that no matter what you do today that moves you away from fear-based decisions and closer to decisions that are more in align with your values and the life that you actually want to live, if you can... Test the borders of what you think you you can handle in terms of anxiety, fear, discomfort, that sort of thing. Any little step you take today in that direction counts. They are additive. You learn from them. Every recovery starts with the tiniest little step, so it's okay to start small if you have to. That counts too. I'll cheer for you while you do it. I'll see you in two weeks. Thanks for coming by. See you next time.